Hello, my name is William Kumwemba, and this is Business Time, a magazine program in which we bring you major business and economic news stories making headlines in the country. And in the program today, we speak to the World Bank as it remains non committal on the uh, budget support to Malawi. And also in the program, we speak to commentators over the recent decision by the Monetary Policy Committee of the Reserve Bank of Malawi on increasing the policy rate from 18 to 22%. That's inside Business Time. Hello and welcome. This is Business Time and my name is William Kumwembe. In our main story in the program today, it's been years of dry taps in as far as direct budget support to Malawi is concerned. Some years back, uh, development partners under the common approach to budget support suspended their direct budget support to Malawi, which has in turn affected the fiscal space as Malawi continues to grapple to fund its operations. Now, the World Bank recently hinted towards resuming budget direct support to the economy. But as it stands now, the Britain institution seems not so clear anymore as to when and how would they resume the support. Our journalist, Justin Kwe, was speaking to Director of Operations at the uh, World Bank, who recently visited the country, Anna Birch, to find out how is the World Bank positioned to commit towards the budget support of the country and has since filed this report. In December last year, local media quoted Kwakwa committing to direct budgetary support by disbursing $50 million, approximately $51 billion kwacha, and $100 million, approximately $102 billion kwacha, towards the cholera fight and recurrent expenditure in the health sector respectively. Kwakwa was quoted to have expressed the commitment when she met President Chakwera in Washington, USA, on the sidelines of the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. However, when asked, the bank's managing director for operations, Anna Berge, fell short of sustaining the commitment on the sidelines of her visit to Malawi last week alongside with other dignitaries, including Kwakwa. Berge was quick to point out that the bank provides different instruments to Malawi that make sure that the support is given to where it is most needed, especially in terms of crisis. So uh, we provide different uh, instruments uh, in Malawi. Uh, the focus on fast dispersing and making sure that our support goes where it's most needed has been absolutely important and pivotal during this time of crisis. So we have really stepped up our support uh, to Malawi over the last year. A lot of the funds have actually been in support uh, for liquidity in many ways. And we work alongside other development partners when we do this as well. So we look forward to providing Malawi with all the instruments that we have in a, in a manner, in a sequence that makes sense in terms of the objectives that we're trying to meet. Here we work, of course, in very close cooperation with others who provide balance of payment support. And we're very pleased to see that Malawi is in a what we call a staff monitored program with the IMF. And as that program uh, progresses, we look forward to working hand in hand and side by side with other development partners to see what we can also do to help Malawi. Speaking during the same event, Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs Sosten Gwengwe gave thanks to the bank for the instruments and grants it provides to Malawi, but also dodged direct budget support. Instead, Gwengwe added that the country is contemplating on requesting for a crisis facility. Malawi as a people do have a friend in need and uh, World Bank is uh, one of such friends uh, because um, we call it a grant on this end, but uh, no money is free. Somewhere, somehow, somebody else deep in the pocket to make sure that Malawians do have this relief. $147 million is not a small amount of money. Uh, we're talking of 150, 160 billion Malawi kwacha to come in as a grant. And uh, the bank all is expecting from us is to make sure that we meet the performance uh, targets that have been laid out in this grant uh, so that we can uh, make water accessible to more Malawians, especially here in Blantyre. So um, it, it, it means a lot to us. 
and it means that uh, we do have a friend uh, in, the, in the World Bank. So you know that uh, our institutions, uh, Blunt Eye Water Board being one of them, have got uh, very uh, 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 st uh, st strong um, mechanisms to make sure that uh, their operations are, are to uh, the expected requirement. They've got a vibrant board and uh, they've got measures to make sure that uh, all is uh, done according to the, uh, the, the criteria set out in, uh, in, in the project. And we have got confidence uh, in uh, the project implementation and the institution that the Blantyre Water Board is. Uh, and um, as government, our full trust is in the operations of uh, um, uh, the management and indeed the board of Blantyre Water Board. And we're confident that additional financing, uh, like it has been done for the Longway Water Board, uh, would also flow for Blantyre uh, Water Board. For that, we have no doubt at all. The World Bank and other development partners cut direct budgetary support to Malawi during former President Joyce Banda era after the cash gate scandal, which showed that billions of money were being embezzled from the budget. Now the European Union has urged Malawi to make what it calls hard economic choices to help stabilize the economy. This was said by EU Ambassador to Malawi, Rune Skenbech, who recently had an engagement with members of the Blanta Press Club. He explains in this interview. Malawi is facing a very difficult situation. And the only way out of this crisis is probably economic growth. To have economic growth, we need a conducive business environment. We need an attractive investor's climate. And we need, of course, effective management of public funds. Uh, the government has done very good and courageous moves in commencing on the restructuring of the AIP, and that is one tough decision. Uh, other tough decisions, according to me, that are required is a review of the legislative framework. What is actually holding down businesses? What is keeping away investors or making them choose other countries? My take is that the, the Forex bill, that the land reform bill, which was enacted uh, recently, that the, the tobacco bill, the seeds bill, the crops bills, are all elements that feed into a reflection of potential investors that say, ah, should we invest in the Malawian mega farms or should we rather go elsewhere and, and, uh, and have a better return on our investment? Uh, and therefore, I, I, I hope that the government will, will will have the courage to do these adjustments, which are the only adjustments it can make or afford, because they don't come with a financial cost. There's no financial margin. But there is a political cost, of course, of taking tough decisions. However, I'm convinced that with two and a half years, they could still yield the benefits and, and leaving a legacy of increased foreign direct investments if those decisions were taken relatively uh, shortly. There is a very significant competition for humanitarian funds, as we speak. We've had a tough year. Now, in earlier this year, we had the earthquake in Turkey and in Syria. You know that in Europe, we are neighboring the Russian aggression against Ukraine, and it's very difficult to obtain humanitarian funds. Nevertheless, I'm happy to announce that we have mobilized 7.2 million euros or 8 billion Malawian kwacha for the disaster response. There is no doubt that Malawi is facing a number of challenges. We, have, we are in the midst of a fiscal, a forex, a debt crisis. Part of the solution to this situation would be an extended credit facility by IMF. This is not around the corner. We have just had the spring meetings in Washington being concluded, and they don't bring so much hope, partly because the challenges that Malawi is facing do not really fit the instruments. What we do know is that there must be a number of changes or improvements when it comes to PFM, so public finance management, and in the macroeconomic context, namely the debt restructuring. We also know that one of the structural issues that Malau is facing is a very significant misalignment between the formal and the informal exchange rates. Last time Malawi devaluated the kwacha, it caused inflationary pressure. 
When we met in November, I said another devaluation in a context where the country have very little exports is not likely to be solving the issue. However, what we have seen is, is to a large extent that inflationary pressure has persisted, that prices to a large extent has adapted to the informal exchange rates. And therefore, it's important at this stage to find a way of aligning the formal with the informal exchange rates. Devaluation is one way of doing it, but there are probably other ways as, as well, but I'm not an economist. Remember, you're watching Business Time, a magazine program in which we bring you major business and economic news stories making headlines in the country. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is Business Time, a magazine program in which we bring you major business and economic news stories making headlines in the country. And my name is William Kumembe. Moving on with the program. Last week, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Reserve Bank of Malawi adjusted upwards the policy rate, the rate at which commercial banks borrow from the Reserve Bank of Malawi as lend of last resort to 22% from 18%. Now, there's been mixed views in as far as the decision is concerned as some feel this would have a huge impact in as far as productivity is concerned. But the central bank feels this is aimed at containing inflationary pressure. Now, our journalist, Chumwe Mangazi, first caught up with the Reserve Bank of Malawi Governor Wilson Banda to understand the rationality behind the adjustment. I think for us as, as authorities, the, uh, the, the focus is on dealing with the problem. The problem is inflation. Uh, the source of the problem is something that you can be dealt with in a secondary manner. So initially we need to, uh, to, to deal with inflation because the inflation does affect the, the small man and woman in the, in the country. So if we don't deal with it, it's going to, it's going to be problematic. Let's deal with inflation by increasing the policy rate. Once that has been done, then we can move on to uh, identifying the source of the problem. Clearly, um, excessive borrowing by government has been identified as one of the areas where monetary expansion is coming from. We need to deal with that as government. I think that has already been addressed. It's been addressed through the budget. The revised budget does um, take care of that. So when, it, when that budget comes to implementation, that is going to contain the monetary expansion. Fiscal expansion. Um, it is because of the one cyclone Freddy. It is it's taken out quite a bit of our uh, national production. There's a lot uh, that was expected from agriculture that has now been affected by uh, the cyclone Freddy. But also, secondly, the, the uptake of inputs. You know, you remember that the AIP did not uh, go to each and every household that expected to receive it. Uh, that too has affected the, uh, the, uh, the national output. So a combination of Freddy and AIP would definitely um, uh, affect the uh, potential output, particularly uh, for the small order. Well, the, 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 the basic idea of um, increasing the, the policy rate is to really affect demand. So if for prices, we expect the prices to go up, obviously, in the short term, and that is going to uh, curtail demand. As it as we curtail demand, that will reduce pressure on a future increase in prices. So in the short term, we expect it, and that that are going to be cost. But definitely, that should not be for long. What role could uh, the price? Yeah, I kept I kept on making this point during the in my presentation that uh, we are producing and exporting very little vis-a-vis -vis what we are importing. We are exporting about a billion uh, dollars worth of produce and we are importing over three billion every year. So the, the private sector can help, can do a lot by increasing the amounts that are, that are exported. We need to, to invest more into exports, we need to, to spend more in producing for export and less for consumption. Uh, if we are going to produce for domestic uh, consumption, it should be targeted towards import substitution. We are not uh, doing a good job in that area either. We need to already come in effectively into import substitution and export diversification. 
we have not done well. But Malawi Confederation of Chambers of Commerce and Industry MCCCI Chief Executive Officer Chancellor Kafira Banjira feels the option could squeeze output and in turn affect growth strides. He explains in this interview. Uh, we, we as a country have gone up to, to, to that level uh, of the policy rate of 22 percent uh, because uh, what that basically means is that uh, the, the, the cost of borrowing is going to constrain business growth. Uh, the, the, the challenge with the uh, you know, an increase in the policy rate is the obvious that immediately the commercial banks are going to adjust their rates. And the adjusted rates will also apply on what has already been borrowed. And that means that the companies that have borrowed, you cannot operate the business without borrowing. What it means is that they are now going to meet the huge costs in order to service their debt. And in the end, you know, they, they also adjust the prices. So this is going to filter into the, the prices, you know, for, for the goods and services that, that, that consumers buy. And the, if the aim, uh, if the objective is to control inflation, because inflation has, as we all know, has gone up to 27%, uh, so if the Reserve Bank wants to control inflation, uh, it may be surprised that the adjustment of the policy rate upwards is going to fuel further uh, uh, the inflation that it is intended to uh, to control. Because uh, the reality is that uh, any adjustment in, in interest rates is also passed on to the goods that we consume because the companies have to pay a, 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 a huge amount in order to service their debts. So, we do not necessarily think that uh, this is a solution to, uh, to, to inflation and we all know what the causes of inflation are. Huh? The causes are that we do not necessarily have enough food, we are entering uh, a harvesting season so the, the expectation is that although indeed we have been hit, by, we've been hit hard by a cyclone afraid, uh, you know, the, the food that we are harvesting is likely to ease the, uh, the, the food inflation. And also we have just gone into uh, the, the tobacco season and the, uh, obviously uh, the foreign exchange that is going to be generated, uh, that is being generated, will ease the foreign exchange challenge to some degree. And we are hoping that the government will also uh, get into agreement with the IMF. I think we, we've heard, we've been told that uh, we should uh, expect uh, results between May and June. So we, we may have foreign exchange. If again the anticipation is that uh, we should already be more, more expensive to borrow even for, uh, for the purpose of uh, buy, buying foreign exchange, then uh, perhaps we, I think we, we are dealing with a, a problem in the wrong way. I, th I think the aim should do, the primary aim should be how do we produce more, how do we generate more foreign exchange, and you don't generate more foreign exchange by making a finance very expensive. Uh, because the, from our angle as the private sector, we are looking at uh, the ability of companies to service their loan, uh, their loans, the ability of companies to borrow for, for, for production, because if they don't produce, then inflation is going to get worse and worse and worse. So we don't, we don't necessarily uh, take the adjustment of policy rate uh, from 18% to 22% lightly. We think that this is going to actually cause a lot of damage to uh, industrial production. Now, in other business news, executive managers have been tipped to be strategic in their choices amid the volatility of the economy and the many challenges that are facing many sectors of the economy. The advice came from the executive leadership experts who were presenting various papers at the Business Leaders Summit organized by the Malawi Confederation of Chambers of Commerce and Industry, MCCI, last week. And our journalist, Chimumwe Mangazi, was there from where he filed this report. Speaking at the end of his presentation at the Business Leaders Summit in Mangochi, organized by the Malawi Confederation of Chambers of Commerce and Industry, local executive leadership consultant Jimmy Lipunga said disruptions challenge leaders to think deeper. It's been rough, and that's not only here in Malawi. It's a global issue. You know, we started with the political uncertainties in 2019, 2020. You know, with the demonstrations, and that brought an uncertainty on the you know, business landscape. Then he hardly 
afterwards we had a corona corona took solid two years 2020 and 2021 it's only 2022 that we had a little bit of relief as 2022 is drawing to as we are beginning 2022 russia attacks you know ukraine and the effects are affecting everybody on the globe disruption of you know supply chain importing fuel importing fertilizers became very very difficult traditional commercial links were disrupted by you know these factors corona especially corona and the and the war yeah, in ukraine it's been tough tough uh, and you can see you know sometimes fuel shortages and Graham Coddington is a South Africa-based business strategist who was also the keynote speaker at the summit. I'm not an expert on the Malawi business environment, but my experience globally um, uh, is that leaders at the moment are, because there's so much change, because there's so much uncertainty, and in a country like Malawi where maybe the problems are at the moment bigger than maybe uh, they are in other places, executive leaders become very tactical. They focus on their to-do list and they forget that one of their big jobs is to be strategic. In other words, if we can use different language, they turn into managers and stop being leaders. And that I wanted to bring the message that our task is to lead. And the leadership mustn't just be to do the job, the leadership must be for transformation, for change. And for me, those are the best type of leaders to work with and work for. One of the participants, who is also managing director of Spark Systems Limited, Wisely Piri, said the summit was worthwhile. We, we looked at transformation leadership in terms of uh, turbulent times that we're passing in. I think the Marawi, has, in particular, and the whole world, we're having a lot of issues, which we all know. Not specific to Marawi, there are all these wars going about. The, um, in Marawi, particular, we've got these Dora issues. So for me, uh, sitting down, discussing the issues we have and probably solutions that we should be looking at. Uh, then again, uh, I think for the discussion of today, uh, specific sector discussions, and those discussions even came into the industry where I am on ICT. So the major highlight for me uh, I can say is um, as part of the solutions um, how we're using the resources that we have as of now I think we've discussed a bit about the forex issues but there was also a question that we posed to say uh, as we're talking about forex are we saying we're at zero uh, we're not at zero yes we don't have enough we've got deficit but we're not at zero So, and we need more but can we also look at how are we protecting the little forex that we have. Then we also look at how do we generate more. Uh, then again, in terms of the ICT, uh, the presenters have also come in, uh, where we've looked at what solutions have we done actually in Marawi. Mm -hmm. And I also presented yesterday on innovations beyond the borders. Okay, uh, it's a global village. So the moment you start looking at your innovations, your solutions, we should not restrict at Marawi. I think that's where we're having the issue. This issue is coming either from government and private sector where they're saying, can we export more and correct forex from out there? So we're also looking at, from our side, to say, can we look at our innovations beyond Marawi? So that those innovations, being Marawian companies, we should be able to pour in the resources from outside in terms of the forex. This is the second summit of its kind organized by the Chamber. That report also brings us to the end of today's edition of the program Business Time. It's a magazine program in which we bring you major business and economic news stories making headlines in the country. On behalf of the entire production team, my name is William Kumwembe. But always remember, if it doesn't make money, then it doesn't make sense. Stay safe and bye for now.